I'm here at the Exotic Wedding Planning Conference in Barcelona, a conference for wedding planners of all abilities and levels. And we've got a sterling group of speakers here at this conference, and I'm lucky enough to sit down and talk to each and every one of them. And here I'm sat with Bernadette Chapman, who is a wedding planner. She is also the founding member of the UK Alliance of Wedding Planners. And I'm going to be chatting to her about her different advice for people in business. So Bernadette, thank you for joining me. Um, what I would like you to do is to just introduce yourself, who you are, what your background is, and what you do. Hi, Kylie. Thanks for having me. Okay, so I'm Bernadette. I'm a wedding planner, and I've been a wedding planner since 2002. My company is Dream Occasions. But I'm also the director and co-founder for the UK Alliance of Wedding Planners, which we launched in 2004. Thank you. So that gives us a little bit of background on you. Now, obviously, as you mentioned, you are the founding member of the UK Alliance. Um, and the role of this is to promote professionalism within the industry, which is something that's obviously lacking in uh, quite a big way. So it's an important role that the Alliance plays. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the Alliance. What inspired you to launch it all the way back in 2004? Okay, well, really the reason why I launched is in, um, you know, early 2004, I was getting phone calls from um, people that wanted to be wedding planners, but didn't know where to get the training. And then I was also getting phone calls from couples who had hired a wedding planner who hadn't turned up on the day. Another one hadn't paid for the stationery. And it made me think that there was nothing to differentiate a good wedding planner from a bad one. So in essence, that was the real starting block. It was having an organization that could A, train people coming into the industry, but more importantly, ensure that the wedding planners that are um, knowledgeable, that are successful, that are insured, have a platform on which they can promote themselves. That was very well put. Thank you. Um, I mean, I totally agree with you. It's that there needs to be a standard in our industry. We are a currently an unregulated industry. So having the Alliance there is also a great platform for wedding planners to just have somewhere to turn to, somewhere to go when they've got concerns and they're not sure what to do and how to deal with different clients and have it as a sounding board apart from anything else as well. So we at the Academy think it's a fantastic platform and certainly for our students, it's a great stepping stone when they leave um, our clutches, they can transfer over to an alliance like your own. So it's, it's a great thing to have. Now, at the Academy, we teach people the art of wedding planning, obviously, mm -hmm. but also how to run a business. And those two things don't necessarily go hand in hand, as we've discussed before. Um, so I guess what I wanted to ask you is for those looking to take the plunge and have this new career and start a new career as a wedding planner, I'd love to hear a little bit about what you think it takes to become a wedding planner um, and also the steps that you can take to really start yourself on that road. Okay, I mean, I, I would say the most successful wedding planners out there are the ones that have the business acumen. They understand that this is a business and they're not approaching it like a hobby. Organising um, numerous weddings is very different to organising your own wedding. So even if you've managed to organise your wedding and it was perfect, you need to multiply that. Think of how many hours it took you to actually organise your wedding. You're now going to be multiplying that by eight, ten weddings in a year. So I'd say one of the most important skills is you have to be organized. And I know that sounds obvious, but you do need to be able to be organized in juggling um, all of the client events that you have, but also ensuring that you're spending time in your business, um, doing your, your PR and your marketing and making sure that your accounting is up to scratch as well. So in my opinion, I think anybody can organize a wedding, but not everybody can have a wedding planning business. You're so right. I mean, being a great wedding planner is what most people can do naturally. It's something that they don't necessarily learn, need to learn to do. They need to learn the finite details, but it comes quite naturally to them. But as you say, the actual business side of it is very, very hard. You have to learn how to sell yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to put yourself out there. You have to understand marketing. You have to understand social media. You have to understand pricing. Um, and that's one that I know a lot of people struggle with. They don't price in things like time. They don't price in things like mobile phone bills. You know, so they end up, as you quite rightly said, looking at it as a hobby instead of a business. And this is something that you know, we really do try and teach people at the Academy. And I know you do too with the workshops that you run at the Alliance. So yeah. you know, it, 
it's a hard one and it's not for everybody as we've spoken about mm -hmm. before um, and I think it's being able to understand and recognize the fact that you are running a business and you're not just planning what looks like great fun events Absolutely. so as you know we're virtual unlike yourselves you do the face-to-face -face workshops uh -huh. everything we do is online um, our students always are looking for work experience opportunities because as much as we can teach them online, there's nothing like getting practical experience. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how, as a, a new wedding planner, you can go about looking for work experience opportunities. Okay, firstly, I would say that um, any students of the academy can contact our members. And if they, if they make sure that, let's say that they have trained with you, so they know it's not a random person coming off the street. Um, and the other thing that I would say is, again, do your research. Yeah. So don't send a blanket email out to 10 wedding planners because it's just going to sort of put a bad impression on you. Um, it's not going to show that you've got any attention to detail. So you want to address your emails personally to each wedding planner. You want to highlight how you love the style of weddings that they do. Um, have some snippets in that introduction that shows you have actually been onto that wedding planner's website. So you need to personalize it. Perhaps think about doing a little mood board about who you are as a person. Um, to, by doing those things, it shows that you are passionate. It shows that you are interested in that wedding planner's business um, and that you have a passion to succeed and a passion to learn. Um, and I think if you can show those things, then it's going to be a lot easier to get shadowing um, experience. Um, I mean, wedding planners do get inundated, yeah. absolutely inundated with people wanting to have work experience. And, and I will have to say, those that say, dear sir, in the introduction <laughs> to me will get deleted you know I want somebody that um, ha you know shows the passion and they're the people that I offer internships to great words of advice there absolutely do your research um, there, there's nothing worse than receiving a blanket email from people I get them all the time as I'm sure you do for marketing and websites and SEO and that type of thing and as you say you immediately delete them but I like the idea of doing the mood board and this is something our students can definitely take on board because their first unit project for us no matter which course they're on is to design a personal mood board about them um, we get them to do that because it helps the tutors to understand who they are, mm -hmm. what they're looking to get out of the course, um, and the type of person that they're dealing with so they know how to tutor them and mentor them. So, you know, they've already done that. So it's certainly a great um, thing that they can add in and it allows, as you say, the wedding planner that they're approaching to understand who they are and what it is that they want. So yeah. thank you, that's a good tip. Okay, so um, wedding planners are known for putting out fires. It's one of the things that we do. Um, and thinking on your feet, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could give us an example that um, where the best laid plans haven't quite gone the way that they should have done. <laughs> Lots of wedding planner stories. I'm sure there's a book there somewhere. Um, okay, so I would say uh, one of the first things is the weather. We can't control the weather here in the UK. And um, I specialize in marquees. Most of my events are marquees, which as you can imagine, if it's been torrential rain, is a bit of a problem. <laughs> so um, one um, such situation a couple of years ago, the mobile bar company um, basically got stuck in the mud right in front of the marquee. Um, and this was about an hour before guests were going to be arriving. So we unloaded the van on a Range Rover, took it round to the, um, you know, the catering annex, still couldn't move the um still couldn't move the van it was st just kept sinking so we then managed to find a neighbor that had a tractor um which pulled the van out onto um you know more, uh, much stronger land uh, but of course the difficulty then was the ground was yeah. absolutely ruined when guests were arriving but there was nothing that we could do about that clearly and uh, the other sort of um, fires that we fix a lot are cakes. <laughs> and uh, I think every wedding planner out there has got a story yeah. about a cake. I've got numerous stories, but I'm just going to tell you one story today. And um, that was quite a few years ago. A bride's um, auntie was making the cake for her. She was a cake maker. And um, I transported the cake. Um, we got it on the table and then suddenly saw that the top two tiers had completely slid. Um, the icing had all cracked. And basically, this was a combination of the fact that it was an incredibly hot day 
and also that um, the top two tiers were fruit sitting on top of a sponge mm. and it was just too heavy. Uh, there was no way for us to repair the icing because it would look awful. So what we instead did is our florist was still there and we had um, lots of big blooms like hydrangeas and roses and peonies. So we used those around the cake. So in fact, the bride never knew because the cake was a surprise. So in her knowledge, the cake was how it should have been. So she never knew there was anything different about it. <laughs> well, thank you. Those um, cake stories, I've heard a lot of those. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, it is about thinking on your feet. You were lucky your florist was still there. You were able to come up with a great solution. The bride knew no different. But I think one of the big lessons for new wedding planners here is if you can't rectify a situation, then it's all about how you sell it to your client. It's all about how you cover up and it's about remaining calm and actually dealing with the situation in hand, even though there isn't an actual solution. It's your professionalism and how you deal with that. So, And I think that's probably something you learn through time and experience. So thank yeah. you for sharing those <laughs> stories with us. Um, I guess one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about, because you obviously deal with a lot of new planners, you you mentor them within the Alliance, you have a lot of tools available for your members. So something you know a lot about is helping people when they first start out in business, to not feel overwhelmed by it all. And I was wondering if you could give us some advice um, from yourself on what you can do to make the pathway to starting your own business a little easier. Okay, I would say my top piece of advice really is to try and keep it simple. Yeah. So what you first of all need to know is um, you know, who you are as a person. So you've made sure that your branding is reflecting you as a person and your target um, clientele. But then keep it simple. So don't try and target everybody. Yeah. Make sure that your website reflects that. Um, Always, I say, I've liked the <laughs> That's okay. Because I just suddenly thought, did I talk about branding in an earlier question? Um, no, or not? I don't think so. No. Okay. You did talk about branding, but in this question, the first time. Oh, okay. Time. You see, that's the thing. I'm like, I know. have I, have that's I? That's all right. We can start that question have again. Have I done that already? <laughs> I'll do the question again. Yeah, okay. No, you did talk about branding, but only in this question. Okay, that's fine. That's then. why it feels like you've spoken about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> we will get there. We will get I there. I promise. Okay. So, Benedette, something I wanted to talk to you about was business. You know, it, within the Alliance, you really help and mentor people um, on their road to starting their business and continuing to grow their business. And I know you have a lot of great tools um, that you offer as part of the membership, but you've also got a lot of advice for people. Um, it is overwhelming when you start your own business. And I wondered if you could just give us some tips and advice on how to make that path a little easier and not quite as overwhelming. Okay, I think the top piece of advice that I have is to keep it simple. So first of all, you need to know who you are as a person. So are you um, attracting the business type people? Are you attracting the creative people? Um, who are you as a person? So are you fun, lively, quiet, shy? Once you have an understanding of that, you can then um, make sure that your branding is reflecting that. So um, don't spend thousands on your very first website. So uh, keep it simple. I know I keep saying that. Keep it simple. Um, with beautiful branding that reflects you as a person and the clients you're trying to target. But just have a very simple website to begin with. I can guarantee within a couple of years, you're going to change your mind. You won't like your logo. You won't like your website at all. And your clientele probably will have changed. Yeah. And so we quite often find with, I know you mentioned the mentoring, but we quite often find is... Um, the planners will launch, they begin to grow their business, and then two, three years la down the line, that's when they really go for it. Yeah. Um, and that's when they're then sort of making a real success um, of their business. So that's number one. The other thing that I have, and I'm sure that you have this with the academy, is that students say, but I'm never going to get hired. I've never planned a wedding before. I don't have any pictures to show. I can guarantee that um, your portfolio and your testimonials are not the reason why you'll get hired. You will get hired over personality. So have they gone onto your website? They have that connection to you. They feel that they know you by visiting your um, website, but also interacting with you on social media. They probably would have done those things um, a good couple of weeks before they even contact you. 
then they contact you and then they've met you and you've had a great consultation um, with them. So that's going to be the reason why you get hired, yeah. not because of any testimonials. However, what I really advise that um, planners can do now is to, in the early stages, organize a um, styled shoot. Um, and this is ideal for so many reasons. Um, number one, it gives you a chance to work with suppliers that perhaps you would like to work with at an event. So you can see whether you're bonding with them. You can work at um, maybe some venues that you really want to um, you know, collaborate with. But also, if you've got some creative ideas floating around in your head, because of course we're all creative, yes. um, this is the ideal opportunity for you to show the world that you can do this job you can style a wedding you can create an amazing theme so organize a styled shoot um so not only would it benefit you in terms of working with those suppliers you'll also get some gorgeous images that you can use on your website and on social media and it gives you something to talk about on social media as well and whilst we're talking about images um don't put images up from your own wedding and let <laughs> Unless, unless they are really gorgeous. Uh, there's no excuses for having poor images. Don't use stock images. They're awful. Um, I know I'm very forthright and um, straight talking, but they are. Um, what I would like you to do is to speak to some photographers um, that you would like to work with. Ask if they can send you some images of, you know, cake, a bouquet, a table center. Something that's more um, general wedding as opposed to real detail shots. Obviously, credit the photographer. And then over time, that's when you can start replacing those images with images from styled shoots or events that you've organised. Um, you're so right. I mean, stock images are what they are. They look mm -hmm. like stock images. And the awful thing is, is they pop up on other people's websites as well. So it's very obvious that they're not yours. Yes. Um, we do at the Academy, as you know, advocate styled shoots in a big mm -hmm. way. We, um, we even have a unit dedicated to how you organize the styled shoot. But I think one of the other benefits to styled shoots is the fact that it's also an experience in planning an event. Yeah. Because when you do a styled shoot, you are writing a concept, putting together the brief, finding the suppliers, sourcing the venue, doing the logistics, everything that you would do when planning a wedding. Yeah. So it does also give people that experience that they're lacking by doing a styled shoot. So that's the other reason why we like to promote them. Now, Benedict, you've been in business for a long time now. Mm -hmm. um, you've obviously had many challenges over the years, as we all do, but you've also had some good triumphs as well. So my next question is really to ask you about your biggest challenge and your biggest triumph. Okay, the biggest challenge is probably social media. Mm -hmm. uh, when I launched Dream Occasions in 2002, I did well to have a website. There was only a few wedding planners in the UK and most businesses didn't have websites. So I, I was doing pretty good yeah. to have a website. Fast forward to 2016, yeah. approaching 2017, that's no longer enough. Um, you now also have to have social media. That doesn't mean that you have to have every single account going, but you need to have a presence on, say, at least three. So, for example, with Dream Occasions and the Alliance, we've got Facebook pages. We've got um, private members, Facebook groups as well. We've both got Pinterest accounts, Twitter accounts, Google Plus accounts, Instagram accounts. The only thing that we don't really have at the moment is YouTube, which you do so incredibly well, Kylie. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, it gets hard because you're trying to organize your clients' events. You're also trying to run your business because you've got to spend time on organizing your business with your marketing, your PR, your accounting. Otherwise, um, it's a hobby, not a business. Um, so that's really difficult. So there comes a time in business where you need to delegate and you need to outsource. And so that's what I do with, um, you know, with both businesses where, uh, you know, I have a PA and we have a social media manager. That's, that's number one challenge. And probably one of the triumphs is the UK Lancer Wedding Planners. And I'm so proud of what we've achieved um, since launching. And, uh, and although it's a little bit cliched, I do honestly love our members. I think our members are amazingly creative. Um, I love the way that they're passionate about learning and about how they want to collaborate with each other. We freelance with each other and how they want to always increase their knowledge to be the best wedding, wedding planner that they can be. And I adore that. 
Thank you. Listening to hearing you talk about the Alliance, it's funny because I can completely understand what you're saying because I feel the same about the Academy. I have this growing number of children, if you will, in my family. But for me, my biggest triumph is we started a um, Facebook group for our students, private Facebook group. And for us, because we are an international academy, I love going in and seeing a student in Melbourne congratulating a student in London on the launch of her business. You know, they ask each other questions. They are so supportive of each other. Yeah. Um, without us really doing very much at all, obviously we, we post things in there, but it's mainly maintained by them and watching their triumphs and the way they help each other, the way they support each other is certainly a proud moment for me. So I do completely understand what you're saying. It, they become like children, they become yeah. your family and you are very proud of all of their achievements. So yes, completely. I completely understand that. And I guess my last question, um, both of us deal with people that are new and coming into the industry. Mm -hmm. um, so we get a lot of approaches from people who are interested in careers as wedding planners, designers, stylists, event planners, etc. And a lot of them don't really understand what it entails. So I was wondering if you could just give us some advice on what you would say are some of the important things to consider when thinking about a career as a wedding planner. Okay, I'd say the first thing you really need to think about is, do you want to be an independent wedding planner? Mm. So do you have that business acumen of running your own business um, for quite a while solo without much support around you? So do you have the strength of character to do that? Or perhaps do you think that you'd prefer to work for someone or work at a wedding venue? So I think that's something that you need to decide first. Um, and then you you need to have a plan in place of of where you want to be. Yeah. So what type of wedding planner do you want to be? Um, try to build a network um, of support around you. And I would say you really need to have a supportive um, partner if you are married or living with someone yeah. because you are working evenings, you are working weekends. There will be times where you will in despair have your head in your hands saying, why am I doing this? Um, and you need that somebody that's going to um, bolster you and say, it's okay, you can do it. Yeah. And I guess, you know, that's why sort of your Facebook group works because your students are helping each other saying you can do it. And that's what our members are saying, you can do it. And um, you need that. You need your own little tribe. You need your cheerleading squad yeah. that's going to support you as you're launching. So that's number one. Is this the industry for you? And then you need to make sure that you're always increasing your knowledge. Yeah. Don't fall into the mistake of thinking you know it all. <laughs> Um, and, you know, even if you've trained with the Alliance or trained with the Academy and you've launched and you've had a great year, um, it doesn't stop there. You've got to continue learning, um, going to conferences like we're at today, um, learning new skills, whether it's bookkeeping or how to make a bouquet or always increasing your knowledge. Um, and, you know, always having sort of a business plan of, of where you want to be. And... Uh, and I guess sort of the, the other sort of piece of advice is, is definitely something that I've really noticed, um, not just in the industry, but probably particularly in the wedding industry, is branding. Um, wrongly or rightly, it's so image-led. Yeah, very much. So image-led. And, and I'm not saying that that is correct. Quite often, um, a supplier is chosen by what does, what's their website like? What are their images like on their social media accounts? And I'm not saying that that's right, but that is quite often the reason why you, you get hired. So you really need to always think about what you're doing um, with social media. So, you know, I know it sounds obvious, but not swearing. Um, yeah. Never posting pictures that are inappropriate. Um, never complaining about clients. Um, always be positive with everything that you do and always ensure that you're reflecting your brand and your type of clients. Always imagine that your perfect client is reading that blog post or um, following you on Instagram. Thank you, Benedette. And you're so right. You know, we're all drawn in by pretty images. Um, but it's about consistency, I think, as well, with the branding side of things. Everything you do should be consistent with your brand and follow that same pattern so that, you know, if somebody sees your logo, it's the same color all the time. Your font is the same font all the time. I remember somebody said to me, would you go into Starbucks and recognize it if it was a different green? 
<laughs> yeah, it, it sounds really obvious, but it's the consistency flowing through your branding that is so important, especially as we are in such an image-led industry as the wedding industry. So thank you. Bernadette, thank you for joining me. Um, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. As usual, you've had some great words of advice, which I know people will take on board. Um, so thank you for joining me. And it's been great to meet you again here at the conference in Barcelona in, on sunnier shores. <laughs> thank you very much. Pleasure. Don't forget, on our YouTube channel, you can also see the rest of the interviews that we've had here with the speakers at the Exotic Wedding Planning Conference in Barcelona.